Good evening, everyone. Um, looks like uh, the expected people, number of people have logged in. Um, so welcome to this uh, AXA webinar presentation. Um, my name is Steve Harrison. Uh, I'm currently a project and policy officer for VET and senior secondary with the Australian Education Union Tasmanian branch. Uh, and I've also been uh, previously involved in delivering and leading vocational education and training in schools uh, for more than 20 years uh, in Tasmania, particularly in rural and regional areas. Um, tonight's presentation is entitled uh, Employment Logic, the cultural shift needed to improve vetting outcomes for schools. And it is largely based around a policy paper I prepared for the University of Queensland and the Winston Churchill Trust under their Policy Futures, a reform agenda um, program, which was uh, inaugurated in 2020. Um, I'm going to just have the video going in the uh, introduction. I'm currently broadcasting to you today from the uh, brand new year 11-12 facility at Dover District School, which is uh, 85k south of Hobart. Um, I live in Dover. Um, the internet coverage uh, at home is pretty patchy, so the principal of Dover has uh, kindly given me access to this amazing new facility. Um, so, welcome. We're, the presentation will go for, uh, I've timed it for about uh, 40 minutes. Um, there is some scope for interaction. Uh, definitely, if you have any questions anytime, put them up in, in the chat. Um, I might not see them uh, in immediately, but uh, I'll certainly get to them and uh, we'll have time to address some questions uh, towards the end. So, as I said, I'll just uh, hopefully be able here to get rid of my video. Hang on, go here, stop my video. Okay, um, so as I said, the, uh, the webinar is entitled Employment Logic, the cultural shift needed to improve vet outcomes in schools. So I'm speaking to you tonight specifically about vocational education and training that is delivered in Australian schools to students in years 11 and 12. And why is my presentation not? Here we go, perfect. Okay, so firstly, an examination of uh, senior secondary education in Australia. And um, it might come as a surprise to some people, but most students exiting years 11 and 12 in Australia do not go to university in Australia. Uh, these are some stats from the OECD and they can see that in Australia about 65 to 70 percent of students uh, who have exited years 11 and 12 uh, do not enrol in tertiary education. Um, so our education system has traditionally been based around a tertiary pathway. In contrast to that, nine out of 10 jobs in the future will actually require a vocational education qualification, according to research uh, provided by the Commonwealth Government Department of Employment. And so we're seeing through some curriculum reform and some major reports that there's uh, a lot of advice coming around that we need to start focusing differently away from an 8 hour pathway until a more broader pathway for our students. Currently in Australia, 50% of students study some VET in years 11 and 12. Now this again is data from the OECD and what the, uh, the meaning of some VET means just that. It does not necessarily mean an entire uh, qualification. It could be a skill set. It could be as much as a short course. Um, so you can see down here, we're actually sitting quite low compared to our OECD uh, um, partners. Um, Canada is, is right up there around 90% and the Czech Republic are down quite low. So the purpose, why do we, why do we offer VET in schools programs in our senior secondary uh, offerings? Well, the Shergold report, uh, which was released last year uh, into the, that was the review of senior secondary pathways into work, education and training, found that VET is primarily a way of keeping non-academically minded students engaged in schooling rather than having intrinsic value for itself. 
So it's a means of providing an educational, engaging educational option for a certain cohort of students. But the VET system itself wasn't designed for that. So the Australian VET system was designed by industry to serve the employment and training needs of industry. Now, whether it does that uh, effectively is uh, th there's a, a school of thought and a continuum th of thought along that. And there is some, uh, some uh, evaluation of, of VET more broadly, but certainly within the school system, the VET is primarily a way for providing an engaging learning program for generally non-academically minded students. And what that does is tends to lead to an undervaluing or a devaluing of VET because the good kids do an ATAR path pathway whilst the others, and by default, if we use the phrase the good kids, by default, the others are the bad kids, uh, tend to engage in VET programs. However, let's look at the outcomes from those VET programs. So in Australia, approximately 230,000 year 11, 12 students do a VET program every year. And only 39% of those students end up with jobs in the field in which they trained. So that, for example, if they trained in a certificate two in business or a certificate two in IT or a certificate two in sport and recreation or a certificate two in trades, when you average them all out, 39% of them actually get jobs in that field. That's data from the National Council for Vocational Education Research. It's 2017 data. So having said that, what does industry currently think about the products of our schooling system? So submission to the Strengthening Skills Report, and this is actually quoted in the Shergold Report, so it's a, it's a quote from a quote from a report. But basically it says, currently Vet in Schools does not offer adequate pathways into secure, quality, sustainable employment once students finish their courses and leave secondary school. We saw that, 39% only. And industry are stating this is because the qualifications typically undertaken by school students, so that's the, the training that they do in the school, do not provide sufficient training or skills to meet the needs and expectation of industry and employers. So, are we preparing students for work? So let's look at some contrasting views. So this again was from the background paper to the Shergold report, where an analysis was made about which of the, well, the three stakeholders in, in senior secondary education, what do those three stakeholders see as essential skills? The st stakeholders were students, education systems, and employers. And if we look at in the middle of this uh, Venn diagram, we see uh, skills such as innovation, collaboration, teamwork, creativity, interpersonal skills, communication skills, problem solving, presentation skills. Now those things should not come as a surprise to us. They are essentially what we call the general capabilities or the work skills or the entrepreneurial skills, whatever you'd like to turn them and, and the terms are different from state to state. But what's interesting is if we look at the, the skills that employers value that are not valued as essential by either students or education systems, and they are aspects such as flexibility, accountability, honesty, authenticity, data literacy, leadership, self-management, initiative, and work ethic. Now, anyone who's been involved in any sort of career education <clears throat> knows that when we're preparing students to write uh, resumes and preparing students for interviews, those factors in the yellow are the ones we get them to focus on when they're applying for jobs. But interestingly enough, they're not the ones that we necessarily see as essential in the educational programs that we deliver. So, 
what do students think? So I'm not sure if any of you are aware of uh, an organisation called Year 13, but they've done uh, some really interesting research into the opinions of our young people shortly after they've left our school system. Uh, this is one of their most recent support reports called After the 8R2, released in 2018. And the question asked was, do you agree with the statement that high school successfully prepares students for the real world? 68% of students who responded to that survey said no, that their high school experience did not successfully prepare them for the real world. Now, if we factor in the 20% who neither agree nor disagree, only 12% of our student body exiting our senior secondary school system in Australia feel that high school has successfully prepared them for the real world. Now that would be a worry in itself, except let's then compare it to how, to what parents and educators think. Now I'm not actually seeing my chat come up here. So if anyone's asking any questions, oh yeah, there's a couple of questions here. Let me just check those. Um, no. Excuse me, I haven't used Zoom like this since last year. Okay, so no questions as such, right. Okay, so what do parents and educators think? In response to the question, are today's students equipped to thrive in the future? Uh, McCrindle, in their research and published in the report, The Future of Education in 2020, found that more than nine in 10 parents, 92% of parents and 95% of educators believe that students of today are equipped to thrive in the workplace in the decade ahead. So there is a serious mismatch between what our students think and what we as educators think. And the question has to be asked, why is there? Why is that, uh, that mismatch between those two perceptions? And I would argue that the disconnect is because us as educators operate within a school system that's nothing like the real world. Uh, now that might be confronting to, to some people, but um, that's what I would argue is, is the reality. And this presentation will go towards addressing why that might be the case. So, Firstly, as I mentioned, the, uh, the policy paper that I'm basing most of this presentation on was prepared for the policy impact program of the Winston Churchill Fellowship Trust and the University of Queensland. And uh, I was uh, successful in gaining a, Winston, uh, a Churchill Fellowship in 2016. Uh, the topic of my fellowship at that time was uh, exploring school to work apprenticeship pathways in the European salmon aquaculture industry because that was the area in which I was uh, both training and leading programs. I spent four weeks in Norway, three weeks in Scotland, visited nine schools and training organizations across the two countries, six industry operations. I conducted my investigation, determined my findings and made some recommendations which were published in a report. And that report just along with most other Churchill Fellowship reports just sat there. Now that's not the fault of the Churchill Fellowship Trust, but that's the, uh, that's the, the situation. So in my trip to Norway, I visited uh, five schools from Stavanger in the south to a school outside Bergen, one at Morloy in the middle, one at the island of Freya, which is just outside Trondheim, and finally a private school in Rövik uh, called Vol uh, Primary Industries School. And from that uh, fellowship, I found some quite interesting and information about the Norwegian education system in terms of vocational education and training in senior secondary. So a little bit of a snapshot of how the vocational system in Norway works. Firstly, in Norway, there is not a TAFE sector at the apprenticeship level. So all apprenticeship level training actually begins and is conducted by the senior secondary schools beginning in years 11 and 12. 
Now they call this model the two plus two model, which means you have two years of education uh, in an industry area in, uh, in the senior secondary school. And then you uh, apply for, and if successful, obtain a two year apprenticeship in industry. You're not able to uh, gain that apprenticeship unless you have done those two years in that industry training at the school. So what it does is it instantly connects industry and schools together um, because the schools rely upon the industry for employment outcomes and the industry relies upon the school for those first year of training of their apprenticeships. The upper secondary schools are known as VGS and I won't go and even attempt to pronounce that, <clears throat> but I will have a go at attempting to pr pronounce the next two programs. So in my field that I investigated in terms of the aquaculture training, students begin their training in VG1, which is uh, our Norwegian equivalent of our year 11, by studying a general primary industries course called Naturabuk, which it covers off on wild catch fisheries, aquaculture, forestry and land agriculture. And they specialize in one stream in that subject. And in that subject in your book, each student undertakes five weeks of work placement in industry. They then proceed to uh, year 12 or VG2 uh, and to a specialist subject called aquaculture. And in that subject, they undertake nine weeks of work placement. Now you might think, well, how do they actually cope with the rest of their studies if they're doing nine weeks of work placement? Well, in contrast to Tasmania, and I'm not sure uh, exactly how this works in, in the rest of the country, but in Tasmania, a full-time year 11, 12 student load is 600 hours per year. In Norway, a full-time student load is 980 hours per year of study. So, as I said, following the, uh, the two years in uh, the industry training in years 11, 12, the students then apply for an apprenticeship and they undertake another two years work and training uh, in the industry. Now, the senior secondary schools also provide adult training for adults wanting to enter the industry in other ways as well. So you can see that already the structure of the system is very different to uh, Australia and the connection with industry is absolutely paramount. And as a result, the employment rates for students in the field in which they've trained for Norwegian students doing uh, equivalent of vet in schools is 96%. Now that's for the students who undertook that five weeks and that nine weeks of work placement, 96% uh, employment rate. But the most interesting factor is the next statistic, because some students do not undertake work placement for a range of reasons. They still study the vocational program within the school in year 11 and year 12. So they're working alongside and training alongside their, uh, their fellow students who do the work placement in industry. So for the students who don't do any work placement, what do you reckon the employment rates might be? Higher or lower? I'll put you out of your misery, 81%. Now compare that to Australia. 39% of our vet in school students gain employment in the industry field in which they trained in their vet in schools program. In Norway, the ones with work placement, 96%. Australian stu students, certainly in Tasmania, um, it's been pre pretty um, familiar around the world, either do no work placement, or maybe 10 days to two weeks work placement. So let's compare this 39% versus the 81%. What is it about the Norwegian system that gets an 81% employment rate in vocational education and training with no actual placement in industry? And the answer, is found in these two concepts, the difference between an employment logic of education versus an education logic. 
So the, the concept of employment logic and education logic were defined by Raffa and Ian Ellie in 2007 in their, their paper, Vocational Upper Secondary Education and the Transition from School. This uh, will be available for you to read, so I won't actually read from this extract from, the, uh, from their paper here, but it does explain it in more depth. But in summary, an employment logic, so a training program that is structured within employment logic, means that the model of training at school and the model of training in industry are designed to reflect the employer's needs. The purpose of vocational education in an employment logic model is for students to gain employment. Employment logic models make sure that explicit links are established between the training, the qualifications and the skills developed to actually enhance those transitions to work. So remember back to that Venn diagram, those, those things in the yellow sphere which were sitting outside the education sphere, those are front and centre. And to do this, to implement an employment logic, the schools themselves, how they are structured and the culture within them are as much like workplaces as the industry to which the students are actually destined. Meanwhile, there is the contrasting education logic where vocational uh, education has weak links with employment, less sharply differenti differentiated from academic education and has stronger links with tertiary education, functions more straightforwardly as a part of the education system as opposed to part of the employment system. So in summary, an education logic is in an education logic model, the role of industry is as a partner in the learning. Industry is there to support the school and to support the student and not necessarily as a beneficiary of that learning, although they may get some on a, on a range of scales. Industry is not seen as the school as primarily a provider of employment opportunities, but as a provider of learning opportunities. And the priority pathway is towards further education, whether that's further vocational education or further uh, tertiary education, but the purpose of an education logic is further education. And ultimately, an education logic model is one where school culture dominates over workplace culture. So, just, um, just have a think and think which one of these logics does Norway reflect and which one does Australia reflect. And it should be pretty apparent. Norway and most other Scandinavian, Scandinavian and Northern European countries tend to run their vocational education programs in, in senior secondary under an employment logic. And Australia, and we're not alone in this, so rest assured, if you're involved in vocational education and training or you're involved in our education system, it's not just our fault in Australia, but most English speaking countries in the world operate their vocational education programs in schools under an education logic. So, Britain does this, and I found that Scotland does this. The contrast between Scotland and Norway, when they're actually so close, uh, 17 hours sailing from, uh, from Bergen to, to Shetland in, a, in an ocean racing yacht. Um, the contrast between the two is chalk and cheese, where Norway is the employment logic and Scotland was the education logic. And basically from my fellowship, I found from Norway the things that we needed to do and from Scotland, the things that we needed to stop doing. Now, there's a lot of curriculum reform happening at the moment. 
uh, we've had the Shergold report, we've had the New South Wales curriculum review, we've had the re recent Firth report in uh, in, in um, Victoria, in Tasmania, we've had our years nine to ASIN years nine to twelve report. So there's a lot of actual movement and uh, going on in the year 11-12 space in terms of curriculum reform. And one of the big uh, common threads is that is that we dom is that the ATAR dominates our programs far too much and we need to move away from an ATAR model. But we do have a, face a big risk there because in the New South Wales curriculum review in their interim report, what they were recommending was moving away from a destination model per se by stating that a curriculum for the final years of school was required that is less focused on meeting the requirements of particular post-school destinations and more focused on providing every student with a broad education that prepared them for ongoing learning life and work. In such a curriculum, there would be no place for dichotomies that separate academic from vocational learning. Well, the last sentence is brilliant. We need to raise the status of vocational learning, but by taking away an ATAR pathway and not replacing it with any pathways, in a system where 68% of our students are already saying that we don't prepare them for the real world, what are we going to be preparing them for at all if we don't have focus on any particular post-school destinations? So there is a real risk here. So let's look a little bit closer at Norway. Now I have embedded this video into, uh, into the presentation. Um, hopefully uh, it, it does stall a little bit. Um, if it doesn't, doesn't work properly for you, I have attached the YouTube link uh, to this. Now this is uh, Morloy Senior Secondary School that I visited in 2016. This is a recent video, <coughs> excuse me, it's just asthma. Um, every bit of footage you see in this video is a school facility. So this is not video of students in industry or on work placement. This is video of students at school. So it goes for about a minute and a half. Um, so watch closely and uh, have a look at how these students are operating in this vocational training model. This boat belongs to the school. If you look carefully at the name of the boat, it's called the school bus. So um, just have a, have a think about um, some of the things you saw there and um, maybe you might want to put some things in, in the chat um, that uh, some, some things that you saw that uh, might have surprised you about uh, vocational education and training in a Norwegian school. So don't be scared. 
I know it's all a little bit impersonal with, uh, with Zoom, but uh, if you've got any comments, feel free to put them in the chat. Okay, so we'll move on. And we might unpack it as we go. Okay, so we've um, all would have seen headlines like this uh, over the last few years in terms of uh, education in Australia and uh, across the world. Too many schools stick to outdated traditions. The absurd structure of high school, educating students for an outdated world. It's time to rethink our views of teachers to help them as, stu as students. And one of the things said about uh, our education system is that it's an, it's an industrial model of education. It's designed for the industrial age. Well, the irony in that is we have an industrial model of education that doesn't serve industry anymore. So we do need to look at some fundamental changes in how we operate across the board, but specifically we do need to look at some changes to vocational education and training. So what I'm going to focus on here in uh, terms of looking at that contrast between an employment logic and an education logic is the thing that we call the soft curriculum. The hard curriculum is everything that we focus our effort on to reforming, what we need to learn, when we need to learn it, why we need to learn it. But there's so many other things that students learn and are taught in school that is not enshrined in the hard curriculum. And that's either called the soft curriculum or more accurately, I'd like to call it school culture. Now, this was the topic of my presentation for my webinar for AXA last year. Um, and the link to that webinar is in this presentation as well. So if you want to actually check that one out, um, feel free, because I unpack a lot of this in a lot more detail. But basically in school culture, what we're talking about are aspects like relationships between teachers and students, timetable structures, behavior management, dress codes, rewards and recognitions, relationships with community, means of communication, such as PA, sirens, assembly, and how student representation is covered. Now, thinking back to that, that video from Morloy School, you saw that they had some amazing facilities. Well, we've got amazing facilities in Australian schools. Uh, so we've got a trade, trade training centers that have been rolled out across the country. They're industry standard facilities. And this is one of them. I, I took these off some random uh, Google image searches. So this is a trade training center, I believe in Victoria. Facilities are not enough. We look at this next one, there's another one taken off Google Images. Now, think back to that, that Morloy video. And what's one difference you see in the difference between how the students appear in these workplace facilities? Did we see Morloy students in school uniforms? Did we see them wearing ties? No, we saw them in appropriate workplace attire, um, personal protective equipment, high vis. We saw them as no different to what employees would look in a workplace. Because <clears throat> when we say that we've got great simulated workplaces with great facilities, a facility is not enough. Now, Collie and, and uh, et al, in their analysis of uh, vocational education and how learning actually becomes uh, embedded, highlighted the fact that learning on the job works not because you are on the job in a facility, it's because teaching and learning is a social and cultural event and becoming not a technical event. And so the setting for the social and cultural context must be as authentic as the technical facilities. So basically what that means is we need to have socially simulated workplaces, not just physically simulated workplaces. 
And if you unpack the assessment requirements from the training packages for vocational education and training, you'll see that that's actually enshrined there, but it's overlooked. So this is the assessment requirements for a unit of competency from certificate two in kitchen operations, one of the most commonly delivered uh, vet in schools qualifications in Australia. Prepare dishes using basic methods, methods of cookery. And it states, and these are mandated assessment conditions, skills must be demonstrated in an operational commercial kitchen. And this can be, note, it can be an industry workplace or it can be a simulated industry environment, such as a training kitchen servicing customers. Now for the qualification that I've delivered for the last uh, uh, 10 years at least, the certificate two in aquaculture, this unit handles stock, has mandated assessment conditions. It says skills must be demonstrated in an aquaculture workplace setting or an environment that accurately represents workplace conditions. So we're not on about facilities. We're on about all those other things about workplace culture that exist in actual workplaces, but don't traditionally exist in our schools. So what are they? If we wanna to move towards an employment logic, first thing we need to do is we need to, in our schools, stop treating 17 and 18 year old students like their children. Stop dressing them up in school uniforms. Stop speaking down to them. Stop uh, denying them student voice. We need to treat them like adult employees if they're to develop adult employee skills. Now the irony is that a 17 year old apprentice who might not be in the school system is treated by their employer and by their training organization as an adult. But even more ironically, a student who may be doing a school-based apprenticeship or a school-based um, apprenticeship and traineeship in SBAT, depending on which state you're in and what, they, what they're called, where they do one to two days a week in industry as an employee being trained and three to four days at school, when they're at work, they're treated like an adult employee. When they come back to school, they're treated like a child. We need to get away from that if we want our vocational education and training to be successful. If we want to operate a school for a school's sake, then we can continue working as we do. The next thing we need to do is we need to replace deficit models of school-based behaviour management with workplace models of performance improvement. So what's a deficit model? It's where we look for students to do the wrong, who was, sorry, we expect students are going to do the wrong thing and if we, look, we look for ways to either sanction that or modify that behaviour. Now we don't have that ourselves in our own workplaces. We have performance improvement models where we are expected to improve, we're expected to perform, and if we don't perform, then our employers take us through a process by which we can improve. Fundamentally different. And when you replace the latter, sorry, the former with the latter, you get a fundamental change in student attitude. Um, for the first time, the students don't feel like the monkey's on their back. And employment logic requires the educators to perform as workplace coaches or team leaders, not as authority figures. So like workplace supervisors. So think back to the Morloy video and you see all the adults in that program there. Apart from the one which looked more like a classroom where the, uh, the maritime trainer was teaching the students to do the chart work, every other adult in that video was involved in the activity as a workplace supervisor leading the students through it. So they were neither the sage on the stage nor the, guide, nor the guide on the side. They were actively engaged in that process. And so were the students. So if we involve the students as partners in our organisation, like we involve employees as partners in our organisation, 
information if we trust them and we expect them to carry out complex and responsible and ongoing tasks as opposed to short sharp learning activities the depth of learning of those vocational um, skills will become so much greater so again think back to that Morloy one <clears throat> the students out on the fishing boat now those that trip goes out there for a fortnight and they're actually on the job working in highly responsible roles learning tasks as well and performing as employees <clears throat> excuse me just like to clear my frog in my throat an employment logic model will also change its time structure now this is not an essential one this is a it's not a deal breaker but it's a really powerful one that if you can structure your time for vocational education and training as work sessions as opposed to lessons you're going to get more powerful engagement and learning so in Tasmania for example our vocational education and training uh, throughout our senior secondary system is delivered on two full days a week if it's a certificate two qualification <clears throat> it's one of the few things we do as a system that is embodying an employment logic we have a lot of work to go like all systems do in in uh, moving to a broader employment logic but one of the few things that we do do is that when a student is undertaking a certificate two in automotive or a certificate two in engineering or a certificate two in business they are essentially going to work for two full days a week in their training their their sessions are not locked into um, lesson times bells sirens um, timetable lunch times uh, lunches and breaks are, are flexible negotiated around the work tasks so that's one thing that we we do do already here in in our state and finally if we want to be honest about employing or in, implementing a true employment logic we must engage our industry as actual true partners and clients in the process for their workforce development we need to make sure that the needs of those employers and industry are being met because goodwill and for industry to engage in schools only goes so far so that's pretty much it just change your mind easy it doesn't cost anything it doesn't really take a lot to change any major changes except for maybe your structures maybe students will have to get workplace uh, um, workplace health and safety equipment as opposed to school uniforms it's easy isn't it we'll just change our mind like that unfortunately it's not as easy as that because we have the education logic dominance in Australian schools because our mindsets have been locked into that model of education for 150 plus years as I said we put all this effort into changing curriculum but we don't put effort into changing how we think about how learning and education is delivered so a little bit of information now about why the Churchill Fellowship Trust implemented the policy impact program and um, I would encourage any of you to apply for a Churchill Fellowship <coughs> they have been put on hold uh, in 2020 and 2021 due to the uh, due to the pandemic um, because uh, overseas travel is is being impossible and that's one reason why the trust actually invested money in this policy impact program because they're aware this uh, this year that too many programs are in particularly for us in schools too many programs that are hero driven they're driven by passionate innovators from the bottom up and bottom up development unfortunately in in, in big systems only gets so far so these are the first of the 11, uh, the 11 first uh, uh, policy impact fellows uh, who were successfully um, involved in the program this year. 
the project was launched at Parliament House. And uh, one fellow you may have been, uh, may have noticed um, who's been getting a lot of pub publicity is Katrina Martin from the ACT, uh, a criminal prosecutor uh, in the uh, Sex Offenders Unit with her uh, fellowship around <coughs> relationships and sex education. And it was very ironic that our launch for this uh, fellowship project was uh, at Parliament House in Canberra on March the 15th. And so while Katrina was inside presenting about the importance of relationships and sex education, the Brittany Higgins March was outside Parliament House. Um, and unfortunately, many of the uh, parliamentarians ran for the hills. Um, but uh, Katrina's got a lot of publicity since then. And it's, it's because we're actually being able to get some policy change as a result of this program from the top down as opposed from the bottom up. So these are my policy recommendations. Now, hopefully you guys are all uh, passionate practitioners at the bottom level, and you might get some inspiration from what I've been talking about and make some fundamental changes in your schools. But my big aim is to actually get some fundamental changes to systems. So the recommendations out of, uh, out of this um, policy program were five. The first one to support the development of VET programs to actually meet industry expect expectations, specifically to develop or to address recommendations 10D and 11 of the Shergold report. And for those of the, you not familiar or have forgotten all of the uh, recommendations, recommendation 10D said that formal VET qualifications delivered in schools must be of a quality that is valued by industry and matches the quality of VET delivered outside schools. Now to do that, we must change our workplace learning culture within schools. Recommendation 11 was that education authorities and industry bodies should formalize their working relationship in order to facilitate the engagement of industry in senior secondary schooling in a systematic and comprehensive manner. Now there's no way that industry will do that unless they are actually getting as much out of the program as they are putting into the program, unless it's to do for their workforce development needs. My second recommendation was to tie school industry partnerships and workplace culture to the Commonwealth school funding arrangements. And um, that one was moving as an incentive. The next one, or a carrot, recommendation three was more of the stick. So all registered training organisations have to comply with the Australian Skill Quality Authority's registrations for standards for registration. And one of those is that they must meet the assessment conditions. Now we've seen prior to this that the assessment conditions uh, require those workplace environments to be the where training is delivered. Now, if RTOs were adequately or audited against whether they provided appropriate workplace environments for the delivery of, delivery of vet in schools, then currently the vast majority of RTOs delivering, involved in the delivery of vet in schools would not pass that compliance audit because our, our environments are facility-based, not socially-based. My next recommendation was to work with the recently introduced industry training hubs. Um, and the first of those was in Burnie, Tasmania, um, that they be drivers of the implementation of socially simulated workplace culture in their network of schools. Interestingly enough, um, the Burnie uh, industry training hub and the Townsville industry training hub that I've presented to both of those have taken this work and, and passed it up through the line. And it looks like this will become policy for the operation of industry training hubs. And finally, recognizing that most of our teachers in our school systems teaching VET are not necessarily come out of industry, but they are school teachers who've developed industry co competence but have largely worked for most of the time within that school culture, that we need to tie funding arrangements to mandate professional development for those VET teachers so that they can develop the capacity to envelop and implement these workplace learning cultures within their schools. Because unless our teachers are supported, then things are not gonna happen or change. So, 
I might throw my um, my screen open again, my video. Okay, so these are my contact details. I'll just minimise the chat here and go back to my presentation. And um, so that's my that's my mobile number. That's my AAU um, email address, projectofficer at autas.org.au. 